All right, so welcome back into the live stream today. We're going to dive into Voyager, some things that are happening with the FDIC, and also what this might look like around the overall scope of the entire crypto market. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Let's get into it today. There's a lot happening from the side of Voyager and also just in general when you think about how this might play out, because this is really getting into uncharted waters, really. If you take a look at some of the things that have been happening, not only with Voyager, but I think in general with crypto, we've had a chance to have some people here on the show with the Blockchain Association. Uh, we got into a lot of that, uh, the regulatory guidelines and what this might look like in the coming years. And one thing that is evident is that what we're seeing today could have some very, very big effects on how the future of crypto may lay out. If you go to this first story, Crypto Lender Voyager's marketing materials under uh, FDIC scanner now, which means, hey, we see what's going on here. We see what kind of situation that uh, Voyager has kind of uh, put themselves in. And this is one thing that we drew out on a show a couple of weeks ago is that when we were starting to really dig into this, we were finding the discrepancies within Voyager statements and what that might look like from a diff FDIC site. Now, does this really matter if you're holding something outside of, of fiat, then it, it's not a big deal. Well, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal, but it's not really a, affecting anybody that's holding traditional cryptos. But in many cases, there were a lot of, of investors within the Voyager ecosystem that were liquidating crypto assets toward the end of Voyager's run before they locked up uh, assets that were li liquidating crypto assets to go into dollars so they could be safe under the guise of what FDIC insurance might hold. So that in itself, if you look back at the story, uh, it's pretty straight, uh, straightforward here. The Wall Street Journal reported that the statement, this was a 2019 statement, the Voyager's website claimed customers would receive full reimbursement in the rare event that USD funds are compromised due to the company or our banking partner's failure. And they use both terminology, but the same statement has now been altered to remove the references to the banking partner Remember, that was Metropolitan Bank, who actually made a statement. We did a release on a Friday afternoon, I believe it was, when the news broke on Voyager. And then by that weekend, Metropolitan Bank had made a statement around the issue of the pass-through element between FDIC going through to Voyager. So now simply saying that in the rare event your USD funds are compromised, you are guaranteed full reimbursement up to $250,000. Now here's where it gets interesting because this gets into an area of implied law and it's something that um, I've had a chance to see and be around from you know, scenarios of companies out there that have gone in this direction of implying certain things. You know, We've been a merchant and a, a provider to a company that was doing these kind of activities, not in the crypto space, but uh, making promises they couldn't keep, and those were really what it boiled down to, is it's the implication of what they're saying is true. So uh, this statement and the fact that they're doing this afterwards is really a big one. Further on, Voyager filed for bankruptcy really days after freezing withdrawals that, of course, remember, this is being uh, held here in the petition was fired in the, filed in the Southern District of New York. So this is big because the Southern District of New York is not a district to be messing with. They are really uh, sticklers for regulations and also compliance. And the U.S. Uh, federal bankruptcy courts are very serious in these kind of scenarios. So it is going to be interesting to see how this plays out uh, within Voyager. We went back to the Wayback Machine. And if you, if you guys have never seen the Wayback Machine, basically what it does is it indexes websites and stores that website in its original format before things get changed or the websites go down, all that kind of thing. So here it is right here. This is the Voyager statement back on December 18, 2019 of that the USD is in fact FDIC insured. So they do go into guaranteed full rep replacement and they go into all the aspects of what FDIC insurance is. So there's definitely an implied security measure here and has been there for quite some time. Obviously, all this being uncovered during this bear um, cycle and a lot of the problems that I think the industry has been plagued with. So interestingly enough, but here's where it gets really interesting. And that is when the FDIC had issued a statement saying, 
wait a minute, we know that this is going on, so we're going to go ahead and put a statement out. Uh, this is came, coming in from Martin Grunberg, who is the acting chairman of the FDIC Board of Directors, final rule on false advertising, misrepresentation of insured status, and misuse of the FDIC's uh, name or logo. And if you go in there, there's two sentences that I thought were interesting in this first one. It's a little hard to read, but I'll, I'll follow me along. For example, the FDIC has seen a number of instances where scammers have made false or misleading assertions that their products um, offer the protection afforded by FDIC insurance. We've also seen, and this is the one I think that applies to maybe Voyager, we've all seen circum also seen circumstances where certain banks, non, or non banks, were making unsubstantiated claims about deposit insurance. And that's exactly where Voyager would fall, is in the non bank. The final rule requires non banks to support those claims and identify the bank or banks within which they have the existing business relationship and into which consumers' deposits may be placed. This information can play a key role in enabling the consumers and, of course, the FDIC. The big concern here is really the contagion effect that I think the FDIC is trying to quell, and that is people having less and less, less faith in the overall and or traditional financial side of things when you go to TradFi versus what we've seen here in the, in the crypto market. So a lot of people kind of saying, hey, wait a minute, this could be a big problem. Uh, for sure. Let's not forget that there are states also that are pushing back on what's happening with both Celsius and Voyager. The implosion is now forcing greater regulatory scrutiny in states such as Texas and Alabama. Again, this gets back into a scenario where the legal woes of these companies may completely consume, because remember, all these states could file against Voyager and Celsius, which would cre create continued legal woes and expenses for both these companies in a time in which they're really struggling to uh, get to that next level, whether that is a, reg uh, a regulation on uh, bankruptcy chapter 11 where you get some reorganization, or if it's Celsius who at the same time hasn't really identified yet which route they're going to take. And, uh, and I've got some stuff on Celsius too to give you guys kind of an insight of this. Um, the other thing that came up that was very interesting here today. And, and of course, many of you probably got the email this morning. We'll break that down a little bit. But Voyager says its customers will get their crypto when 3AC settles its debts. This is going to be tough because 3 Aeros Capital is pretty much uh, on the lam right now. It's been impossible to locate them. There's a lot of drama going on around the regulations with uh, 3 Aeros Capital because that one is a completely different kind of bankruptcy liquidation proceeding that they're going through with their attorneys. But what is interesting here, I want to kind of highlight a couple of points here. And this is the uh, statement that they were talking about on Monday. In addition to its outstanding claim against 3AC, Forger holds around $1.3 billion in crypto assets on its platform. The plan is to redistribute these funds with customers receiving a combination of a pro rata share of crypto, so a portion of crypto, pro rata share of proceeds from the 3AC recovery, which may never happen, and then a share of common shares in the newly reorganized company. I'm assuming that would be private common shares because I'm not sure they would get relisted. And then a portion of existing Voyager tokens, so the VGX to token itself, which may have some interesting aspect of how this all plays out. So if this were to be uh, construed as distribution back of your crypto assets, it looks like it's going to be of a lot of assets that may or may not have any value, especially the one in terms of grabbing uh, proceeds from 3AC. So that in itself, I think, is a bad sign for what it might look like, especially from a crypto holder. Now, on the USD side, still very questionable as to whether or not that is actually going to come through in a pass-through in environment because of the fraud process that they have to go through to be able to release those funds, which is going to be interesting because I don't know completely how the banks or excuse me, the courts are going to be looking at the US dollar assets, especially because they're customer accounts, depositor accounts. So very interesting. So you can kind of see the update here. Uh, we understand how critical it is to access the value of the account. We're working through this process as quickly as possible. Uh, today's post provides a little bit of update on what's happening there. So again, just really not a great position. I think, you know, overall, as we see this play out, 
most likely this is going to take maybe the next year to 18 months to really get to some sort of finality on what is going to happen with Voyager for sure. Listen, if you guys like these kind of videos, the breakdowns, a lot of these news elements, make sure and hit like because uh, that's a one way we get great feedback from you. And also make sure and get your questions over on the side chat. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can for sure. A lot's happening here. Celsius also changed its legal team to pay and paid off $20 million in the Ave debts. This, and this is interesting because Celsius is nearing um, a point of where they won't have any debts uh, on the books. And this is interesting because I want to highlight this right here. This is where it gets a little bit weird. This is a report from, again, Wall Street Journal Sunday. This is, company has hired the lawyers to advise on options, including the bankruptcy filing in place of the previously hired law firm, Aiken Gump. And the Kirkland and Ellis LLP described itself as an international law firm, serves clients, and so on. But what's interesting is the law firm has also been tapped as the general bankruptcy counsel for Voyager Digital. So you've got a lot of mixing of the minds here. Now, could this happen? Sure. This just seems very, very unusual. Uh, I guess within the state of the fact that there's not maybe a lot of a lot of attorneys that really understand what's happening in the crypto space could be uh, somewhat of a limitation and still have the expertise level to operate in a federal bankruptcy hearing. But if you look at what Well Roger is talking about just in, Celsius, of course, has reclaimed $410 million in collateralized uh, staked ETH after reducing its debt from Aave now down to $8.5 million. And I think the next tweet kind of breaks it down. Celsius total debt dropped under $60 million. That was previous of that but they anticipate it could be debt-free within uh, 24 hours. So we may see that this week of a completely debt-free Celsius. And I'm kind of curious, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is the strategy of Celsius? If they've got all this free collateral back, are they going to go to the market to just liquidate that to try to make uh, members whole? Or is there another plan here? Maybe a restructuring, maybe they go into the position of a Chapter 11 where those assets could help in aiding in the recovery of how Celsius might come to market. I know there's a lot happening between Celsius and like what Simon Dixon is trying to do in terms of restructuring plan. Some of it may or may not necessarily be um, capable though, which is going to be uh, the interesting part. Here's another one right here. Celsius repayment of its debt to DeFi protocols could create a new paradigm in finance. Um, and this is kind of the, uh, the aspect of this. This is very interesting. In companies, there's a concept known as the capital stack. And the capital stack sets the order of who gets paid. Many people call this the cap table in the liquidity uh, event of a bankruptcy. Now that it's par- now it's perfect analogy. This isn't corporate finance. It's capital markets. And this is a very generalized view. But what it basically does is it lines up the different rankings in which people would get paid. So you've got senior debt. This is going to be usually bank debt, uh, most privileged and the least risky part of a stack. Uh, and it also gets the lowest return. So that's one other. And then you get the mezzanine debt, which is the debt that gets paid out after the senior debt. Sometimes it's secured, sometimes it isn't. So that could be somewhat arbitrary. Then you get preferred equity. This is senior uh, to common stock, which is uh, returns come from equity accrual. So it's going to be the stakeholders and the investors within uh, Celsius, uh, typically kind of what they are uh, identifying here is typically what the VCs get preferred, typically um, gets income distribution in lieu of voting rights, et cetera. And then common, this is subordinate preferred equity, but as voting rights, this is the riskiest part of the capital stack and tends to, you know, it does well on common stock in terms of overall, but if you're in it in terms of holding, then uh, your payout is not great. Vald also issued an update on, because this kind of all circles into the companies that are left in this kind of situation and what this might look like. Vald issued an update regarding potential Nexo buyout. And some things they highlighted here, again, is a backup plan. So does that kind of lead you to the point, is Nexo either backing away or maybe there's some terms in the deal that aren't necessarily favorable to Vault? Uh, Vald, so that could be causing a problem as well. So the company says its core filing should not be viewed as a first step to winding or shutting down the company. Top priority is to complete the due diligence process with Nexo. And if the Nexo purchase does not go ahead, Vald says it's considering a range of backup options, including raising more capital, 
exploring other uh, acquisition plans, um, maybe waiting for some of the deployed capital to be returned. That would be interesting. And then the possibility of converting debt to equity. That's an, a typical scenario of people who have a debt scenario uh, within an investment architecture and they do a, a debt conversion uh, and make that into equity where they actually own a percentage of the company. So issuing its own token is another one and then developing a payment plan uh, tied to the future revenue. So that may be an opportunity again back to getting into how Vol might come together. Vol CFO of course left uh, and we'll probably see more and more exoduses from non-senior staff even though this is a chief financial officer uh, within that for sure. The big concern here, though, across all of this, whether you look at Celsius, Voyager, Vald, any of those, and also other companies that might be on waiting in the wings right now that we don't even know about, is uh, Fed, uh, Fed Brainerd basically saying that crypto needs regulation now before it becomes so big that it threatens the uh, current financial system. And I think what they're looking at is that with all of these kinds of failures, the potential contagion effect could spill over in traditional markets. We, I believe we may have seen that this week with Bitcoin dropping into 19K. And hear me out on this. When you look at the issue within China, where there's bank runs happening in what is a superpower country, whether they're regional banks, international banks, et cetera, the fact we're seeing bank runs uh, because you don't see those kind of things happening in the United States right now. Could we be seeing already a little bit of contagion effect where people are saying, maybe I should just pull a little bit more out of my bank. I don't know if that's going to happen here in the United States. And when you have that kind of scenario, people in many cases, if they're owning Bitcoin, maybe they're trying to convert to cash. Could we be seeing a Bitcoin exodus into cash in this scenario where we start to see a lot of these bank runs. So that is another uh, concern of how that, the, the concern I have, or the issue I would say is where do you, where do you store that? So you, do you have to diversify? Remember here in the United States, FDIC funds are only uh, per depositor per uh, ABA routing number. So even if you had two or three accounts uh, and you were above that level and you're a whale, uh, you've pretty much got to do a hopscotch whack-a-mole type thing with banks just to be able to control your funds even in fiat. So definitely uh, something to be watching for. FSB also is submitting crypto and stablecoin regulation reg recommendations in October. And when you look at the FSB, the international body that's monitoring the purpose rules of the global financial system, this to me is the first step into where we will see, uh, especially stablecoins, being regulated from the G20 level, meaning this is going to happen in Europe, most likely around the world, before maybe we even see uh, Senator Toomey's regulation play out in next year, in 2023, on stablecoin regulation, most likely USDC being one of the big winners. So a lot of this still uh, kind of up in the air of how this might play out. The crypto regulation build does aim to bring greater clarity to DAOs. This is another factor that's going to start playing into it is how DAOs are going to be looked at from a crypto regulatory uh, clarity standpoint. And I think this could end up also being some very interesting strategies. Uh, if you saw the news on MakerDAO, who is trying to integrate literally in with a traditional bank. So we'll see how this comes. Uh, this came in right here, fact sheet. This is the framework for international engagement on digital assets. Again, we're getting back into a lot of the weeds of how this may play out for digital assets. But the big point is that we will see executive orders and most likely more regulations leaning in on where digital assets are going to go in the very short time. And I want to kind of break down some of the objectives of the framework. This has been talked about a lot. One, of course, is just protect, protecting consumers and investors and businesses. They want to protect, number two, U.S. and global financial stability, which I think is the biggest one right now because of the contagion effect, and then illicit finance and national security. That's mostly AML and what we see in a lot of regulatory guidance that have really ra ramped up. And I talked about this uh, earlier on the show, is that now entity onboarding with things like Binance U.S. and even Pinex, if you, were, if you saw Pinex U.S. launch here, 
Um, KYC and AML requirements now are so dense and stringent for entities like businesses to even start a crypto trading account. The requirements are just unbelievably stringent to be able to get that done. We went through the process of just trying to test the system and I'm finding more and more loopholes of things that you have to require that actually are a little bit way outside the line. I've never seen a bank or even a trading uh, platform like a, you know, a TD Ameritrade or something of that nature that went down that far. So I think we're already starting to see the pushback of what has been happening with Celsius and Voyager with regulators starting to maybe issue guidance to a lot of these uh, exchanges kind of going in this direction. So lots, lots happening. Uh, global crypto regulation, this is some of the things more more about the policy objectives. We talked a little bit about that. Um, the kinds of regulators that are going to be involved. Now we've got the FATF that's going to be involved in this. I mean, I think we're going to be in a state right now. In, in When you look at what's happening within next year, so many different regulatory bodies that may f- start to really fall into this. And I fear that we may get up into a scenario of over-regulated crypto. That's my biggest concern right now. So If you guys are out there looking at maybe getting into crypto, maybe now is the time because I think we are going to start seeing more and more loopholes and more hurdles that you have to leap through to be able to get into this. So for those who have been uh, maybe thinking about getting into crypto, maybe now is the time to do it for sure because hopefully you'd be grandfathered in 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 these kind of scenarios other than KYC, which is, you know, just a scenario. Uh, Last tweet here, any fundamental differences between Celsius and Voyager stop withdrawals on their customers and the Chinese banks doing the same things. Looks like risk managers not managing risk particularly well. Uh, And again, this gets back to managing your own keys, guys. And you know we talk about this so much here on this channel is getting into self-custody. I'll leave a link below to the ledger. Uh, And if you listen, if you don't like ledger, go and take a look at Trezor's. But get into these hardware wallets. It is one of the best and safest ways to secure your crypto. Self-custody is really the only way to do it. I implore you, you should be looking at uh, going on exchanges strictly for your trading requirements, move in and then move out. It's just a simple process and it's easy to do. I know you guys have asked to do a ledger and or a hardware wallet video. We'll probably do something like that a little bit more step-by-step for you. Um, maybe make it part of the diamond circle. That might be a better you know, place for it. But make sure, and of course, check out the diamond circle. If you guys are not in the diamond circle, get in it. It's a couple of emails a week. We drop in some of our own uh, crypto power index data, and we do a lot of AMAs and things like that. Let's get over to some questions, and I know we have a poll, so let's jump to that one as well. All right, do you feel that Voyager made false or misleading claims? So pretty much everybody's saying, yes, this is getting out of hand, and this should be it. So... Maybe this is going to play out for it. I hope so uh, for the benefit of people who are holding USD in there. There were still a lot of people that are holding USDC in there. And that in itself is going to be interesting, especially if regulation starts to hopefully protect USDC in the future as a stablecoin, as an alternative source there. Let's get into some questions. All right. Uh, so we're going to have some. Seriously, though, if you had money on sales here for you, you could possibly get a big tax write-off. That's for sure, but tax write-offs are, uh, I mean, with this market right now, I think people are going to get plenty of tax write-offs because we got so many assets that are in the dumps. Celsius paying off loans, do you feel like they have an opportunity to make customers' withdrawals possible? That's the question. Uh, this is a very good uh, question there, Zafani, um, is they're paying off these loans to get to the asset. It is worth greater value. Remember, when you take out a loan, you're not, you know, if you lo- take a loan out on a house, your total value is much greater than that of the market value. And if you can't pay the loan back, that bank is going to liquidate you and sell it for whatever they can on the market. In some cases, they like to liquidate you because they'll get more money than what your equity is. But these are the kind of scenarios. It's really just a balance sheets uh, play where they may have a billion dollars in real equity of value, but yet only $400 million in loans. And you would definitely want to get the 400 million paid back so you can get your billion back in your equity and then go to the market and sell it. That is a good sign, but it's also a sign that could align, as I was alluding to in that one of the stories, it it also could align to the cap table for Celsius. Meaning if they do decide to go chapter 11 or even on a liquidation point, 
is it would start liquidation on the cap table tier. And unfortunately, the customers, I think, would be in that common stock level, meaning you're last on the totem pole. So that might be the other play out on this. Is part six 20K portfolio coming today? Today is no. Part six, we, okay, so we're going to do our portfolio uh, seven and eight, I believe it's seven and eight, uh, coming out on Friday. We've got, um, I, th- I can't remember the guy that's going to be on. I think it might be a full value Dan that's going to be on with us. We've got two different tokens. We're going to do utility and exchange tokens for you guys. So we'll break those down. There's some good utility tokens in there. Don't forget when we do those shows, we want you to give us feedback because there's some tokens in the audience portion side of that uh, that's going to be in as well. Also, we're going to have James over on the show from Invest Answers talking about Solana later this week. So don't miss that one. That will be a big one. Celsius is still sending me rewards. Yes, but frozen uh, weekly slap in the face. No kidding. Uh, It's uncanny how Celsius and Forger CEOs, yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you for reminding me about that. You know, and that's something that is an issue because when we interview people, and it's one of the things I'm I'm doing even more so now, because I do get people who will dodge questions. And as journalists and as an interviewer, you know, to a certain extent, especially when it's live, you don't want to call them out on it most of the time just out of courtesy, but at the same time, You feel like, okay, if you're not going to answer the question, okay, fine, not a problem, don't answer the question. But you should, and I think we should, outline those kind of scenarios when they are not willing to answer the question, then they kind of sidestep those things. And Steve had done that with me a couple of times on several of my shows. And, you know, that was on me because I probably should have, well, not probably, I should have just said, listen, if you don't want to answer the question, I I completely get it. Maybe there's something there that uh, may be proprietary or other aspects of it. In this particular case, it may have been something they were just simply trying to hide. So I just don't know. But we are definitely a lot more due diligent in scenarios like that now, much more so where I think people think we're a little bit of an asshole to, to say, listen, we're not going to let you sidestep it. You know, either answer the question or don't, but you know, we're going we're to ask you anyway. Um, in the end, it all makes Forger uh, very different. Okay, makes Forger any different than Terra Luna, Three Arrows Capital, even Enron. And I think, you know, you're right, Josh, is that In these kind of markets, we are faced with bad actors. And it doesn't matter if it's traditional finance and if it's in the oil and gas industry or if it's in crypto, you're always going to have bad actors. And bad actors will be able to dupe anyone, even the best. And that's including, if you think about all of the investment capital that was in Terra Luna, the amount of investment capital. These are very, very smart people managing very large funds, all of which got caught in these kind of scenarios. So it's not really down to the point. These are scenarios where these are intended bad actor movements. And unfortunately, I think this is only forcing the hands of regulators to really push out what we will see, I think, is a little bit uh, heavy-handed regulation. And, mo- and it will kill the b- bad actors, but it would also, unfortunately, probably keep some people out of the crypto markets in the future. You share your thoughts on regarding, uh, regarding Mount, uh, you mean Mount, Mount Gox, I think. Uh, do share your thoughts. Okay, so Mount Gox, in terms of the fact that they would be releasing and they found uh, or have recovered uh, a certain amount of Bitcoin that would be released back into the market into wallets that may have known it will know how much is going to get released back into the market. I don't necessarily think it's going to be a major hit to Bitcoin in general. It could though, because it would be a landslide uh, windfall profit for those people that were holding Bitcoins at around three or four hundred dollars, now worth you know twenty thousand. So uh, it'll be interesting. Cardi seems like Celsius is using our funds to pay off their debts. Could be, but remember, again, back to, and I I would agree that that's a bad thing unless they end up using this for good in the sense of trying to recover the full asset. So back to my analogy, you have a billion dollars in assets, 600K or million in loans. You can get to that extra 400 million as an asset as a whole. Now you've got your billion dollar asset back as a whole and your 400 million in the positive. So If that is the kind of thing that is happening, I hope it is, because in that kind of scenario, if they do come back, then it would be the biggest David versus Goliath comeback ever, I think, in all of the history of business, you know, so are we asking too much for that to occur? Probably so. I feel still that this is probably going to be a liquidation event. 
I don't understand why anyone other than Canadian citizens would ever want to do business with a Canadian bank, especially in crypto, especially after what's happening with, okay. Well, I think, you know, the scenario, remember, um, Voyager was a publicly traded on the Canadian stock exchange, but their operations were based here in the U.S. In fact, their bankruptcy filing was in the state of New York. So it is a U.S. scenario that we're dealing with. They were just being traded as a public, uh, a public stock within the uh, Canadian Stock Exchange. Dragon, uh, crypto securities designation will, blo- uh, will be the black swan event, but, will, uh, but they will not die from it. All right, so that's, yeah, and again, I think that, yes, we'll get some. There will be heavy-handed. We may see a lot of our favorite tokens uh, deemed securities and put under heavy scrutiny, hence the they would essentially dissolve in some cases because a lot of them would not be able to handle the scrutiny of of that in case we see scenarios play out within the SEC's case with Ripple because that's a lot on the line right there. Voyager and sadly Celsius misleading and disingenuous. I think, you know, Hill Dog, this is kind of the the result of it. The point of all of this that I hope you guys are taking from today's video is you have to assume that every one of these projects that you're investing in, that you believe in, that you think is going to do well, you have to question them. You have to ask those hard questions. And in most cases, maybe even assume that everything's a scam and then let it play itself out to prove it otherwise. But the one thing that you can do, at least in the step that will help you, and that is get into self-custody, because if you were in Celsius and you self-custodied uh, at, in or and around, uh, you were in good position. Same scenario with Voyager, if there was a self, self-custody solution. But obviously, these companies don't even exist if more and more people got into self-custody. The, cha- the exchanges would be few and far between. Your exchange rates would be higher for trades, because that's how they're going to make money now, is on your trade as opposed to going out and playing with your assets, which I'm okay with. Uh, if we get into three to 5% trades, you know, until we get into a scenario where someone like a Robinhood is doing it within, you know, pay for order or scenarios like that, even though that most likely will get regulated out. So for sure. If you don't mind, can you please explain why some of us would be locked out of the crypto market? So here's what I'm saying is if we get overreaching regulatory requirements, most likely it's going to come in the way of what they call, um, well, it's like uh, the scenario where accredited investors play into this, all right? So a accredited investor has to go through a certain litany of questions and or the proof, both financially and ed- from an educational standpoint, that they're capable of investing. Otherwise, you cannot invest. Now, there's a lot of laws on the books already where you as an individual cannot invest in those kind of things. That's why angel.co was set up to do syndicates to invest micro-investing within startups because you could not touch that before. If we see overreach regulatory, because uh, what their place will be is we want to protect the American consumer. So what they do is they make it where the middle class and the poor cannot meet the requirements to be able to invest in cryptocurrencies. Maybe they say, all right, you have to be an accredited investor, which simply means you have to make $200,000 a year and have a million dollars in assets to be able to invest or they make you go through such a litany of educational requirements to make you completely understand everybody would have to pass that. Some people can, some people cannot. So it's not as easy as it is today of spinning up a Coinbase account and buying Cardano or doing something with Polygon or getting into MetaMask or going over to Uniswap. It's a pretty much free for all right now. So that would really kind of change the framework if we see overreaching regulations. So a lot of that's what we're really worried about right now because of the over, um, I think, scenario of exposure that the market has kind of imploded on a lot of American and global investors. So it's a big one. All right, so you guys are tuned in. We appreciate you jumping in. Make sure and subscribe to the channel right now. Hit like before you leave. And don't forget, when you do that, it's going to give you the live updates when we're doing a lot of our drops on where Bitcoin is going, updating on sentiment data, getting Gareth back in on our trading analysis. All of those kinds of things happen when you're subscribed to the channel because it will tell you when we're going live. So make sure and do that. And of course, if you want to jump into our private group, it's just, uh, you know, the diamond circle.
jump in there. If you want to reach me, it's out on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath. Thank <laughs> you.